Reminder, today's conference is being recorded. Well, guys, so that's just as a reminder, we are recording so that you will be able to pick up the recorded recorded webinar after after the fact. Uh, today's presentation is hosted by the Polish Project on Ecological Group Governance, and it's under the Living Water Policy Project Initiative. And before explaining the webinar series as a comprehensive package, I just want to explain how the series came to fruition. It's a bit um, of an interesting story. And um, of course, we have our, our partners, uh, the Walter and Duncan Gordon Foundation, the Canadian Water Network, Water Canada, who is our media sponsor, and Sir. So the Polar Project, for those that may have not have heard of us, we're a research center based at the University of Victoria. We were established in 2000 by the Eco Research Chair of Environmental Law and Policy. And it is really where academic and policy research on sustainability meets community action. It is a hub where many projects work under under the Polish banner and um, and the water sustainability being one of them. The water sustainability is probably what you're more aware of and it um, and we began in 2003 and we really focus on water governance and new and integrated approaches to water management and decision making. Uh, the project focuses on making a shift of the water paradigm based on conservation, stewardship, and sustainability. And we recognize that, of course, there's a technical element to water management, but we really focus on the social lens and that water management issues can't be fixed by examining the t technical issues alone, but we also look at governance and, and how we govern our businesses, government, industry, and civil society around the environment. For those people coming onto the line now, if you can just uh, apologize for this, but if you can just mute your line so we don't get your background in, um, noise, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Hmm? Okay, so the Living Water Pol Policy Initiative is hosted under the broader Polish banner, and it consists of a group of emerging water policy experts. There's the, 14 of us who came together to put together this wa website, which you can see at waterpolicy.ca. Um, and, and we have a wide range of professional backgrounds, and we came together really to look at, at the reliability and accessibility of information on provincial, territorial, and federal water policy. Water policy actually in Canada, as I'm sure many of you Realize is an appearance of exciting change as provinces and territories develop the, and implement a more comprehensive policy. The momentum that water policy in Canada is experiencing highlights the fundamental role water plays in the health of our environment, community, and economy. The momentum we are seeing is much more difficult to capitalize on, though without a clear understanding of the history of policy development, understanding the gaps, and understanding the opportunities available to improve what we do. So in an effort to consolidate information um, at various government levels and uh, related to water policy, and in an effort to improve the access to knowledge around Canadian water policy activities and improve our ability to participate in the public policy dialogue, we've created this, this website, as a, um, and the link is www.waterpolicy.ca. Um, and kind of the, one of the more neat features of this tool is the Provincial Water Policy Comparison Tool. And what it allows you to do is compare three provinces at any time across different policy issues. And this is a screen cap, and unfortunately you can't see, but if you were on the site, the screen, the, um, the, the policy issues would be along this left-hand column that you can compare. 
Um, anyways, and in doing this groundwork and in doing this research, we really began to see both this great opportunity in what people are doing across the country, but also this gap in creating a consistent conversation around what was happening in water policy, and also examining the new research and the ways of thinking that can improve what is already happening. So enter the webinar series as our small way of trying to uh, improve the dialogue. Um, and it's, it's aimed at policy experts, regulators, First Nations, lawyers, policymakers, NGOs, and academics, of course, and everyone on the line. And um, each webinar is actually part of a larger, more comprehensive package. So we've worked hard to ensure we're covering these emerging policy concepts by, pre by bringing in experts from across the country. And each webinar will be set up mostly the same. We'll have two speakers. One will present kind of the broader trends and theory, while the second speaker will speak more to the implementation and on-the-ground issues. We've also worked with Water Canada, our media sponsor, to provide background reading in each of their associated magazine issues. So for this one, um, if you look at the August or July-August issue of Water Canada, there is the Coast Factor, which can be considered background information for this webinar and can also be found on waterpolicy.ca site under the webinar section. So we, we've created these background readings associated with the magazine, the webinar, and then following the webinar will be briefing notes summarizing kind of our biggest challenges and our biggest opportunities. And all of these will be available on the waterpolicy.ca website. So today's webinar is really an introduction to Canadian water governance and what is happening on the ground and how to move the agenda forward. Um, so obviously, subsequent website uh, webinars sorry, are listed above or on the screen. The Blue Economy will be October 13th, and the associated article will be coming out in the September-October uh, Water Canada issue. So I now want to just introduce our, I'll introduce both our speakers, and then I'll hand it off to Rob, Dr. Rob DeLow first. So Rob holds the University Research Chair in Water Policy and Governance at the University of Waterloo and is Director of the Multi-University Water Policy and Group and Governance Group. Previously, he held the Canadian Research Chair in Water Management at the University of Guelph. During the past two decades, Rob has studied and written extensively about water security and related concerns such as water allocation, source water protection, and climate change adaptation. He draws on his research to provide policy advice to a wide range of government and non-government organizations in Canada at scales, ra scales ranging from local watershed to international river basins. In January 2008, Rob was named chair of the advisory panel for the Royal Bank of Canada's Blue Water Project. It's a $50 million, 10-year charitable grant program to support freshwater conservation, protection, and accessibility. And our second speaker, Nancy Gouchier, is uh, the project coordinator for the Forum for Leadership on Water Issues. As program coordinator, she is responsible for the project management of all flow projects, research and policy development, communication, outreach, and website management. Nancy graduated with a Master's of Environmental Studies degree in planning from the University of Waterloo, where her research focused on how Ontario's Conservation Authority create adaptive capacity and the knowledge required to respond to current and emerging threats to water resources. She has published numerous articles on water management issues in Canada, including academic journal articles in environmental management and review of policy research. Most recently, she co-authored a report with EcoJustice called Seeking Water Justice, Strengthening Legal Protection of Canada's Drinking Water. Now, I'm just going to pause while I pull up Rob's uh, presentation, and we will get started.
All right, Rob, you are all set to go. All right. Uh, so first of all, Liz, uh, can uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, let me begin by uh, saying uh, I'm actually a little bit excited to be part of this here. This uh, I noticed that uh, Bridget mentioned this is her first webinar, and it's mine too. Uh, it, um, it's quite wonderful and astonishing to see that it actually works, uh, which is always kind of nice, I guess, when we when we use these technologies. So thanks to uh, to Polis and to the various sponsors for giving me the opportunity to chat to you folks today about water governance. This is a, a topic that um, I find really, really fascinating, and I'm delighted to say that uh, my interest in fascination is, is, is being shared by lots of people and organizations around the world. So what I want to do uh, with you today, folks, is just to have a, a little conversation about water governance. I want to spend a few moments telling you what, what I think these terms mean, talk a, a bit about some trends. I'll use the example of uh, source water protection to, to illustrate some of the tangible concerns that I think are really important, and, uh, and then I'll, I'll point the way to some, some next steps. And hopefully uh, people will have some questions and comments that uh, we, we can pick off the, off the screen here during the question period. Okay, so now, apparently I can change the slide. Let's see. Whew, look at that. All right, so what, what are we talking about when we talk about governance? Well, I guess uh, the, the way I like to think of it is what we're interested in is the ways in which societies organize themselves to, to make decisions and, and take actions that affect water. And if you step back from the, the wordiness of the definition for a moment, you, you realize that, well, that, that speaks to a whole bunch of of different ways we can organize ourselves, everything from a strong role for governments, the state, to situations where, where people self-organize at the community or grassroots level and form groups and organizations that make really important decisions about governance. And so there, there are a bunch of concerns that are really common, and they're really quite universal, too. I mean, we, we can be concerned about how it is that we decide what we, we are going to do. You know, what, what are some of the mechanisms? Who's involved in deciding how we make these decisions? I mean, that's pretty crucial because if we're leaving some important groups out that really should have a role, that's uh, going to be a source of conflict. It's going to be a reason for uh, ineffective decision-making. What roles are the various people playing? One of the neat trends I'll be pointing to in a moment is the fact that there's been such an enormous change in, uh, in the past decade or two in terms of roles that governments play versus people who aren't in governments. And really a question that speaks a little bit to how we're organized in society in terms of power is how do we decide who's involved and what roles they play? Now my particular concern today is water governance in Canada, but the kinds of issues and challenges that we're going to, to hear about today are actually global. There's been a important and really widespread recognition around the world that a lot of the water problems that we face, whether we're dealing with water shortages, flooding, water quality problems, compromised ecosystems, uh, challenges to water security, you name it, I think there's been a, a really widespread recognition that these problems certainly have a, a technical, technological dimension, but really, for in many respects, the and in many cases, the largest part of the problem is us as human beings and the way we behave and the way we organize ourselves to make these decisions. So there are some genuinely common experiences around the world, which is important because it means we can learn from other people in other places. But at the same time, we have to be a little bit sophisticated about that because there are also, um, because context is incredibly important. And I mean, everybody, I think, fundamentally understands how important context is just by looking at their own situations and thinking about why things work and don't work in, in their own communities, in their own organizations, wherever they are. Okay, so what are some, uh, some trends? So the, so the organizers of the webinar asked me to speak a little bit to some, some trends, some patterns, uh, and of course it's, it's, you have to be careful when we generalize, but, but I think there's a few things we can point to that uh, are true across much of Canada, and that are also quite true around the world. Uh, one of the very important... Rob, sorry for interrupting. I think you're moving away from the phone every once in a while, so it's fading out. Okay. What I'm going to do is uh, I'll try the handset then. That, is that better? Is that clearer? 
Uh, I just uh, no. It's it, it sounds as if you're moving your head away from the speaker. Okay. Well, I uh, I will try to hold still here. Okay. So some global and Canadian trends. I think maybe one of the more important ones we can think about is a, is a rethinking of the role of the state in water governance. And and I'm going to generalize a little bit here, but I'd say historically in a, in Canada, governments have been the primary source of authority in terms of decision making and, and where many and or most of the decisions have been made. Uh, and governments certainly remain responsible, of course, for key water management functions. I mean, the Constitution hasn't changed in that respect, but we're seeing new and, and really very different roles uh, for, for people outside of the state. And these are things that go much beyond public participation. We're seeing new ways of governing. Instead of relying just on the tools that were in the toolkit a couple of de uh, decades ago, we're trying all kinds of, of new tools and approaches, everything from market mechanisms to multi-stakeholder collaboratives. And so we're seeing a, a whole bunch of new opportunities, but also a whole bunch of new different kinds of challenges. And the drivers for all of these changes, of course, are going to depend very much on, on where you are. In some parts of the world, uh, the drivers might be uh, uh, some kind of a water crisis. So, for example, in the Murray-Darling Basin in Australia, we've seen huge shifts in, in terms of governance in the last couple of decades, all relating very strongly to the drought. We're also seeing, just in general, though, I guess if I pointed to a few, we're seeing increased complexity. I think it really is a, a genuinely more complex world today. We're seeing challenges to the capacity of governments to do things. We've, we've realized that they can't. Uh, and we're also seeing some pretty important attitudinal shifts. As citizens, we're no longer willing necessarily to just have the state uh, deal with, with water problems. We've come to recognize that, it's, that we play critical roles. All right, so I want to just take a second to talk a little bit about uh, this question of who this we is. Uh, when we talk about, you know, we play critical roles and we're interested. And it's a very complex, complicated landscape in Canada. As I said a moment ago, governments continue to be critical players, the federal government, the provincial territorial governments, and local governments. There's a mix of water management organizations that play key roles, so where I live, in Ontario, conservation authorities, which are organized around watersheds, are very important. A uh, whole range of private sector firms, from consulting firms, engineering firms, water provision companies. Financial institutions, I think, are increasingly important players. Industry, NGOs, indigenous people have emerged on the stage uh, as absolutely essential players in water governance, and I think this is transforming some of these relationships researchers, ordinary citizens, you name it. So there's a very complicated mix of actors. Uh, the state remains a central player, but, but lots and lots of other people are now playing leadership roles. And again, this creates some of the challenges that we're going to take a look at in a few minutes, some of the governance challenges relating to things like accountability and, and legitimacy. Okay, now let me, uh, I, I've given you just a, a couple of broad ideas to think about uh, in terms of overall trends. I, I find that a lot of these things make a lot more sense if we can use a specific example. And so I've chosen the example of source water protection, but I, I want you to realize, though, that the kinds of challenges that I'm going to be talking about today are found in all contexts relating to water. So maybe your interest is more water allocation, or maybe it's water supply at the local level, or you're concerned about uh, local ecological conditions and habitat. The, the challenges are very similar. They shake out in different ways. Um, uh, each, each particular context makes some of the challenges more important than others, but there's lots of things that are in common. So. When I talk about source water protection, um, I'm going to focus very much on the drinking water perspective at the moment, and that's very important in lots of, uh, you know, all across the country. But I, I do want to mention, though, that source water protection, I think, is not really just a drinking water concern. So, for example, you could be in the agriculture sector and be very concerned about the quality and quantity of water that is important for crop production and for livestock production, you name it, right? Um, so there are lots of, you know, source water protection is more than just the drinking water piece, but the drinking water piece has come to dominate uh, in Canada 
since Walkerton and North Battleford, a couple of uh, very important recent contamination incidents that demonstrated that we need to be more alert and more aware of the safety and quality of our drinking water. And so there's a little tiny diagram in the bottom right-hand corner of this image, which is an illustration I borrowed from Conservation Ontario, which is showing uh, the multi-barrier approach to drinking water safety. And the idea here is that uh, if we want to be sure that the drinking water we receive from uh, a, a municipal system, a communal system, is safe, um, we, have to, we have to put in place preventative measures at all steps. And so source protection is, uh, is, is the first step. Other ones, of course, are the water treatment system, the distribution system, the monitoring, regulation, and testing, et cetera. My concern is for that very first step. And it's a very straightforward and, and eminently sensible concept, the idea that if the water that we bring into a water treatment plant is, is in relatively safe and clean condition and doesn't have pathogens and viruses and things in it that we, we need to be concerned about, then it will be cheaper and more effective to treat that water and there's a, there's a greater chance that we'll have uh, drinking water safety. So in that context, when people talk about source water, they're talking about the water in streams, lakes, or aquifers that supplies drinking water systems. And then source water protection becomes all the activities that we take to protect the quality or quantity of source waters. And this is where it gets really interesting because then you can start thinking, okay, well, who's involved and what might be some of the things that, that get done? And so on the what gets done part, I've just provided a couple of bullets in the top right-hand corner. You'll see uh, common examples of tools that are used in source water protection are land use zoning, um, inventories of contaminants to find out where the, the threats to water quality are. Uh, land acquisition strategies are used in some cases if we identify a sensitive or vulnerable aquifer, for example, sometimes the only effective way to protect it is to actually acquire the land but also stewardship, the kinds of individual things that, that people can do in their homes, uh, on their farms, in their businesses, to ensure that their own practices don't contaminate uh, water, water quality and perhaps don't uh, you know, result in water shortages as well, which is, is the other piece of source protection. And if you think, okay, well, who's doing these things, right? Well, then all of a sudden you, you see that that vast landscape of actors that I laid out in a general sense uh, is actually extremely complicated at this level. So we have municipalities, of course, which are uh, across Canada responsible for land use planning. We see landowners themselves, business owners and operators. Uh, we see um, provincial governments, which are putting in place some of the regulatory systems and regulatory frameworks. And when you think about the landscape, the, the constitutional landscape in Canada, it gets even more complicated. So. For example, um, First Nations communities on reserves are areas of federal jurisdiction. And so in the framework for source water protection that we've created here in Ontario, where a lot of the action is happening at the local level, uh, reserves represent areas where the provincial jurisdiction doesn't apply. So one of the challenges we're going to face, and I'll come back to this point a little bit later, is finding ways to, uh, to, to bring source water protection onto lands that are not under the, the provincial jurisdiction. So you get an enormous number of actors, and, and clearly they're not all governments. In fact, when you think about who's, who's actually going to have to change their land use practices and behaviors, uh, you find that many of the really key players are outside of government. So for example, in rural Ontario, where a lot of uh, agriculture is occurring as an important land use activity that affects water quality, being able to work with farmers uh, is, uh, is going to be a, a really important part of source water protection. Okay, so what are some of the challenges that result from all of this? If we've moved from an, area, uh, from a, of an era where governments use their regulatory authority as the primary vehicle for, uh, for managing and governing water resources, uh, what are some of the challenges that happen when all of a sudden we shift into this different world where we're using different mixes of, of tools, we're no longer just relying on regulations, we're looking at non-regulatory things like stewardship activities, but, but also when we're organizing ourselves differently to make decisions, when all of a sudden it's not just uh, government officials who are making the, 
the critical decisions, but all of a sudden they're being made by, for example, partnerships of, of different actors at various levels, the people who are involved. What are some of the challenges that result? And here I've listed uh, a great big long list, and I, I, I certainly won't uh, go through all of these. There's too many to talk about here. But these are uh, a generic list of, of water governance concerns that we see all around the world when we're, when we're dealing with these new forms and with these new groups of actors. Um, I just want to say a few things to illustrate what I'm talking about, and I'll point you to a place where you can get some more information if you're interested later. Um, but look at that first point there, this idea of establishing leadership and commitment. I mean, one of the things we've discovered all across the country and around the world as well is that when we start, uh, for, when we start shifting responsibility for making some of the critical decisions down to uh, much more diverse multi-stakeholder groups, figuring out uh, who's going to play those leadership roles and ensuring that we have long-term commitment becomes a real challenge. Um, the second point is one that people who work in, in, in most contexts relating to water will recognize as being really critical, is the, the basic challenges of securing resources and building the capacity that we need uh, to be able to undertake the kinds of activities that are important. Creating and sustaining legitimacy is, is, a, is a fundamental challenge in this new world of water governance as well, too. Uh, in our representative democracy system in Canada, for example, it's fairly clear uh, that the political system assigns legitimacy to our elected officials. Whether or not we voted for them, at least we understand the, the process through which they are exercising their powers. But when all of a sudden a lot of the key decisions are being made by unelected bodies, for example, uh, that uh, where we haven't, as, as individual citizens, haven't had any sort of a say in their formation, but they're making critical decisions, legitimacy becomes a challenge, and it's something that has to be actively sought and, and reinforced. Accountability is, is a challenge that we're having to grapple with all across the country when we're forming uh, watershed groups and watershed councils to make decisions about how resources will be used and how conflicts will be solved in an areas where governments still hold a lot of the formal authority and responsibility, uh, determining who's accountable then becomes a, a particular challenge because it's, it's not, uh, accountability isn't something that can be transferred very easily to some of these bodies. Uh, just a, a couple more that are particularly important in the context of source water protection, adapting to stresses uh, close to the bottom. Um, one of the challenges we face, of course, is that we're seeing stresses on water resources from the ordinary kinds of land use change that are happening in urban and rural areas all across the country. Uh, but at the same time, we're seeing that climate change, as it's transforming the hydrologic cycle in different ways across the country, creates additional stresses and changes. And we need to be able to adapt to these things. So we need to be able to put in place uh, ways of governing that are flexible and can adapt to new changes. And finally, that Last point at the bottom is really critical for source water protection too, the challenge of integrating the different kinds of institutions. Uh, often in the water world, we emphasize the importance of the watershed as a, as a tool and as a basic framework for making decisions. But one of the challenges, of course, is that the watershed doesn't match uh, the, the, um, the bodies that are actually making a lot of decisions on the land, which is municipalities. So a lot of the, uh, we've adopted a watershed-based approach to source water protection in Ontario, and this has involved uh, fitting together uh, all of the different municipalities that are in one or more watersheds, and that, that's a major challenge. Uh, integrating the systems we've created for land use planning versus water management is another major challenge, because these have operated in isolation for each other for such a long time. Okay. So I'm at the end here, lots of challenges, but the good news is I think there are also lots of solutions out there too. And one of the, one of the sources of ideas I think that is really important is our own experiences. Uh, all across the country, there are, people are grappling on a day-to-day -day basis with the kinds of challenges that I've just touched on so very briefly here. And so in many cases, the, the problems that a particular organization or group or community or government has are, are similar to the problems that exist in other places. The trick is, first of all, finding out who has those common experiences, and second of all, figuring out how we can learn effectively from them. 
Uh, and, uh, and, and that's a real challenge, of course, because if, you're, you know, if your job is you're on the front lines and you're dealing with uh, you know, the day-to-day -day problems associated with your job or your mandate, um, you may not necessarily have the time to, to scan and to find out. And so um, many of the ideas that I've been sharing with you uh, on the session today emerge from a, a project that um, we're leading here at the University of Waterloo, which is called uh, Governance for Source Water Protection in Canada, where we're trying to bring some of those ideas together. We're trying to understand the nature of water governance for source protection in Canada, uh, identify uh, much more clearly the things that work and some, what some of the common challenges and solutions are. And so what I've done here is pop up a screenshot uh, for the website we've created recently uh, for this particular project. Other ways of, of grappling with some of these concerns is, is recognizing that, that there are solutions, but that we need to treat governance as a specific focus. And this comes back to a point I made at the very beginning, where I think historically we've, we've viewed so many water problems as being technical or technological in nature. And we need to now recognize that while that technological dimension is still critical, we have to actually tackle the governance challenges in much the same way we would designing a new filtration system or, or building a new plant. We have to pay careful attention to the design of institutions for governance as much as we pay attention to the design of, uh, of the infrastructure that provide our water. So there you go, uh, just a very quick tour. Um, I think we have some time left for questions. Liz, I hope I haven't used up uh, all of the time. Um, uh, are you planning to handle questions right away, or are we going to take them after Nancy's talk? Why don't Why don't we do five minutes or ten minutes of questions with you before we start with Nancy? Just to, if anyone has clarifications they want or um, questions specific to Rob, please feel free to start chatting, uh, putting them in the the chat box, and we'll and and Rob will start answering them. And I actually have a, a question, Rob, to, to start the discussion off. I'm just wondering, um, you talked about a lot of the, the challenges that, that we're experiencing, and I think a lot of people across the country are experiencing. I'm wondering um, if you can speak to knowledge gaps. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think there, there are several. The, the easiest ones to point to, of course, are, the, are sort of the basic the basic data gaps that face us in water management in general. And this isn't really a, a knowledge gap relating to how we should govern so much as something people have recognized as, as the basic foundation of good decision making. So, um, I mean, so, I mean, that's an, an obvious knowledge gap. But I think one of the things that we're particularly interested in our project, for example, is closing up or addressing some of the gaps that relate to some really basic questions, such as, you know, how, how do we most effectively uh, integrate decision making for land use planning and water management, for example. How do we most effectively make use of uh, of, of regulatory tools and non regulatory tools? The, the challenge I find for a lot of people working in this area is that uh, there are lots of excellent sources of general advice for how one should proceed, but the trick is to match that to your own particular situation. And so then we get into a very specific knowledge gap. So somebody could, could quite easily uh, find some good resources on, well, what are some, you know, what are some basic steps or principles we can use for collaborative water governance, right? And they'll read that, well, you know, capacity is a real challenge. But you need to be able to understand and evaluate and measure uh, your own capacity in your own community, your own watershed, your own region, whatever the scale is that you're working on, in order to be able to make those sensible choices. And often we don't have that kind of information either. No, I, I, I think that's that's great, Rob. Um, often people find, I think, that we have a lot to learn between provinces and between territories when we look at where different jurisdictions are in their policy planning process, but I think we often um, have trouble putting it in the context of our of our own situation. Okay. And I just, I'm noticing a question from Vanessa, maybe you can yeah. take. So Vanessa is asking, have we discovered any region or organization that has successfully integrated land, air, and water issues, and how can we learn from them? Well, I mean, there's the, the $64,000 question. I'd say, first of all, uh, the triumvirate of land, air, and water 
uh, I couldn't name one. I couldn't name one where we're even getting close of truly integrating uh, governance uh, for land, air, and water issues. Um, where we are getting closer is in the area, I think, of land and water issues. And I've mentioned Ontario a couple of times, and it's not just from sort of, you know, hometown pride here. Uh, prior to Walkerton, Ontario was not a particularly good example of how to do that at all. In fact, I would say like a lot of jurisdictions across the country, uh, we more or less forgot about water in this province. And it took the tremendous shock and sadness and tragedy of Walkerton to motivate some change. So we are on the cusp here in Ontario of actually, uh, I think, being able to make it that really critical connection to land use planning and water management because one of the things that we've done in our Clean Water Act is uh, we finally said that municipal official plans must have regard for approved source water protection plans. And that little bit of legal mumbo jumbo is actually incredibly important because historically what we've done is watershed management organizations have made watershed management plans and municipalities have made municipal official plans and zoning bylaws and whatnot and those things haven't communicated to each other terribly well at all. And by finally making that little institutional change and saying, right, you know, those of you who are involved in land use planning, you know, you need to be aware of the implications of your choices uh, relative to the quality and quantity of the water resources, which is what the source protection plan is pointing to. So um, it's miles too early to say that, you know, Ontario is a leading light and that we've solved this particular problem because we are just at the early stages of implementing this. But that critical step of actually putting in place that legal requirement uh, is, is really important. Okay, um, where is the best forum for sharing our experiences and solution making? By sharing our stories, we can effectively learn from each other. Boy, I mean, that's another fantastic question. Lots of places and lots of organizations have tried to create those conditions. And so uh, the, the network that Liz has described in that website is, is, I mean, is an excellent example, for instance, to understand the, uh, you know, the, the nature of water governance across the country and policies and regulations and these sorts of things. But some of the things that are more challenging to share are the lessons and experiences and things that work. Because, of course, everybody, I can be interested in this as an academic because of curiosity. It's, it's an interesting area. I can be really fascinated. Um, I can spend a lot of time exploring these different lessons. That's my job. But if you are actually in the business of it's your job to try to protect the water resources, you don't have that luxury. And so what, we're, what we need is, is, is accessible tools that people can use. And actually, one of the goals of the project, whose website I had popped up on the screen there, is to produce those tools. I mean, we're going across the country trying to understand the different experiences in, uh, in, in all parts of the country and try to synthesize and communicate effectively some of the lessons for what is working effectively and, and what isn't. But, but that's, you know, that's an absolute challenge. Um, okay, uh, Stacy, how do you envision the role of government changing in governance moving forward? Again, I mean, this is, this is one of those questions where the answer is going to be very different in each jurisdiction. Uh, the, the role of governments is changing for, for different reasons. On the one hand, it's what we're seeing is a, a much greater role for voluntary organizations and for non-state actors, as I call them. Uh, sorry for the academic jargon, but it's a, it's a tidy way of capturing them because the, the state has walked away. And so we've seen this all around the world where if in the absence of uh, citizens and other interests coming together, um, things simply don't happen. In other cases, we're seeing the, the governments themselves for, for a whole variety of reasons, maybe being aware of their limited capacity or maybe actually believing it's most appropriate to try and share uh, decision-making responsibility. What is the appropriate role for the state versus non-state actors is a, is a real moving target. And I'm always very, very cautious of, of offering one-size-fits-all solutions. I'll, I'll give you a very good example. Um, 
I think that in some context, I would be, uh, I am deeply uncomfortable at the idea that the government isn't front and center. So, for example, I would like to think that the standard for arsenic in drinking water, uh, in the water that is in the mug that's sitting beside me on the table here, has not been the product of a, of a negotiation and people sharing and compromising. Uh, I, I would like to think that it's based on a regulation based on the best available science. So, so there's a, an example where I think the state has a, has a clear role. And there's lots of other examples that relate to standards and regulations and procedures and these kinds of things. In other contexts, though, when you look at uh, how should the people, for example, in a, in a, in a watershed that is facing uh, a, either a drought or water shortages, how should they resolve their problems? I mean, these are classic examples of where uh, it's often most appropriate for the for governments to be uh, up to a point partners in the process of people working things out on their own. We find you often get more enduring solutions. You know, so so the answer is. Uh, you know, it really it, uh, people hate it when you say, "Well, it depends," right? But it really does depend on uh, the local circumstances. You know, what are what are people capable of? And it also depends on the particular context. Okay, um, Jason, uh, it strikes me we haven't rarely enabled a robust command and control system on water issues, which begs the question. Is collaboration, collaborative management, primarily based on political expediency, and that is a that is an important and powerful critique of collaborative processes, and it has a lot of legs. Um, you'll find that in a lot of cases, that's exactly the reason why. And not, I'm, I'm not speaking of Canada in this case. Looking around the world, that's exactly the reason why some of these collaborative processes have been established because it some governments have recognized that they're a way of, for example, co-opting or silencing critics, right? And I guess you could, you could step back then and say, well, but, but that isn't a, a situation of genuine collaboration then because the power to create or, or not create these, these kinds of bodies rests with the state, right? Um, True collaboration involves uh, a greater sharing of, of not only you know knowledge and resources, but also the power and authority, right? Um, but it, but it is a it's a it's a critique that we we all have to keep in mind, right? That uh, we have to be very very careful that when collaborative processes are offered as the way forward for some of our governance challenges, that it's not simply uh, as a way of, of for example getting around responsibilities or co-opting people. Liz, how are we doing for time? Three more questions. Oh, sorry, we have three more questions and probably about seven more minutes. Okay. Um, above Jason's question, there was Brian. Yeah, I just spotted that one. Okay, good. Uh, and then there was a private question sent to, I don't know if it was sent to you as well, but how can a national water policy best support local source water protection? Okay. Uh, another winner. Okay, so let's do Brian's question. Looking across Canada, is there a good convergence of approaches to water governance, or is it more of a helter-skelter of approaches? Uh, absolutely, unquestionably, helter-skelter. <laughs> we are seeing some, some broad trends. I would say at the provincial level, uh, more and more collaboration is becoming common. Uh, but what exactly that means and where it occurs is uh, is a real moving target. In my judgment, looking across the country, I think uh, it, it's um, it's definitely a mix, and I even go so far as to say it's uh, hundreds and hundreds of experiments where people often aren't entirely sure of, of what the goal of the experiment is or what some of the outcomes might be. So I think it, it would be fair to say that we are definitely in – a learning phase right now, and of course the problem is that we're we're learning by doing, right? We're not, you know, doing these experiments in a laboratory where if things don't work, we can, you know, grow a new culture and off we go. Uh, we are actually doing these experiments in the real world, and and it, on the one hand that's exciting because there's a lot of learning by doing, but one of the things that worries me about all of this a little bit is that uh, we do need to be concerned about success. We need to be concerned about whether or not collaborative approaches, for example, 
are working. And one of the things we don't have is a really clear sense of, well, what does that mean exactly, working, right? And again, there's lots of debate on this particular question. I mean, some, some people are genuinely pleased with a collaborative approach if it builds trust and relationships and social capital and all these good things, whether or not uh, water quality, for example, is improving. Other people, I think, correctly point out and say, well, hang on a second. Um, that can't possibly be good enough. The reason we're trying this approach is because we want better environmental outcomes, right? We want uh, fewer degraded ecosystems. We want reduced risks of contamination. We want improved water quality, et cetera. So, I mean, you can imagine the challenge when, when we can't even agree on how we measure success. Okay, so the other question was, the uh, well, what could a national water strategy contribute to this? And I think that is a... That's a terrific question. I've been a little bit of a booster of late for a Canadian national water strategy because I view it as the, uh, and if you'll permit me a maritime analogy here, it's the, it's the high tide that floats all the boats, right? Um, there are lots of areas where by taking a national or even a regional approach, uh, we can make be everybody better off. Uh, so, for example, common examples, the, the most common example perhaps relates to things like sharing and pooling of data and information, um, but there are lots of other ones. I mean, a classic case in point would be sharing and pooling of, of insights in terms of what's successful and that isn't successful in governance approaches, uh, collaboration across borders, um, you know, a, a national vision or a national approach for water, uh, which is based on some, some common principles, for example, that are shared at the local level, that creates a platform uh, that we can all use to make ourselves more effective, to level the playing field, to, to bring attention and resources, et cetera. So, um, so I, I definitely think that even though we might talk about a national strategy, uh, that doesn't for a second suggest that we're only dealing with, you know, issues that cross the international border. I think what we're actually looking for here is something that, uh, that, that floats all of our boats down at the local level, too. Rob, there's actually one more question if you could answer Andrew's, and then we'll move on to Nancy. Um, and Andrew's question is, which mechanism do you see driving improved governance, the Fed, the CCME, the Conference of the Federation, or NGOs? <laughs> yeah, well, um, uh, it's unfortunate, but the, the, the Feds haven't, the federal government in my opinion, hasn't demonstrated a tremendous amount of commitment to water policy uh, in a good long time, uh, and uh, let alone to a lot of basic water management activities. And, and that, that's an unfortunate thing because the federal government is a critical player in a national water strategy. Some of these other bodies uh, have helpful roles to play, but one of the interesting things I think about a national water strategy is that it is inherently collaborative. It's a really, really big example of, you know, multi-stakeholder, multi-level governance. And so the answer in, in most respects is all of the above. Uh, and I would add in, too, that I think some critical players that weren't on that list are water-using industries who are often viewed as, as, a, as a source of problems or a threat, and, and for very good reasons, obviously, uh, when you look at some of the outcomes of their activities. But the bottom line is um, they are critical players that need to be part of the dialogue. So when you're talking about moving forward the agenda for uh, a Canadian national water strategy, uh, if you flip back to that slide where I said, okay, who's involved in, you know, Canadian water governance today, absolutely every one of those uh, actors is part of the story, uh, including uh, Indigenous people, so you know, First Nations and Métis and Inuit communities, etc., are absolutely a critical role for constitutional and legal and moral reasons. Governments, water-using industries, ENGOs at all levels from local to national, uh, you name it, which, of course, makes it incredibly complex, not impossible, but certainly very complex. Thank you so much, Rob. And if you can stay on the line, perhaps there might be questions that people can get back to you after Nancy. But for now, we're going to shift over to Nancy's presentation. And are you 
all set up? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so I wanted to thank everyone for attending. Um, for those who are not aware, I work for an organization called FLOW, the Forum for Leadership on Water, and we are a collaborative of water policy experts from across the country who believe that all levels of government must work together towards a Canada-wide water strategy. So it carries on nicely from the conversation that you guys were having with Rob. Um, so I just wanted to mention that we've been active in the policy debate since we published uh, Changing the Flow in 2007, and uh, we published it under the name Gordon Water Group. So it outlines seven priority areas that we feel the federal government needs to take uh, towards a national wa uh, federal water strategy. So uh, Rob also touched on this, but I just wanted to emphasize that we are functioning in a really complex management paradigm. Um, it's an increasingly difficult tax, task to manage water issues in a, um, with respect to lots of different trends that are happening. We have global environmental trends caused by phenomena like land use change, new sources of pollution, changes in hydrology due to, due to warmer temperatures. We have economic trends that we must deal with as water managers caused by instabilities in the global economic system, ever-widening income gaps between the rich and poor, etc. And then we also have uh, changing social trends. And these are constantly changed by circumstances like evolving perceptions of acceptable risk. Um, and as a result, we need to adapt to these changing ideas of governance, as Rob also explained. Um, and we need to change our expectations of an open and transparent decision-making process. So this all requires water policy analysts to build bridges and capitalize on synergies with other sectors. So for example, we can't solve water problems without looking at water pollution, health impacts, economic competitiveness, um, all these uh, global trends. So to move from water policy to move water policy from paper to reality will require involvement from sectors across the board. So as Rob was talking about, he mentioned lots of actors. We have NGOs, government, academics, we have private sector and industry. Um, and we need everyone to work together representing a unified Canadian water policy domain that embodies a collective water ethic. And such a water ethic might be seen as the sanctity and the importance of water being reflected in our governance systems through individual and collective decision making. So in the simplest terms, a water ethic can be defined as the principles that guide how we value and manage water. And uh, if you tune in later on subsequent webinars, Bob and Marilyn Fair will be discussing this further on November 1st. Implementing this ethic would require a supportive framework, and I just included two key components that I wanted to highlight. The first is a strength in democracy, or a well-functioning democracy, from the global to national um, to local levels, to impose limits where limits are necessary and create broad-based and nonpartisan political support. So this in involves creating governance structures that are flexible and adaptive, that can quickly and effectively adapt to surprise and take advantage of the opportunities to move towards sustainable management as they arise and new information becomes available. We also need strong NGOs and academic sectors that have the ability to continuously contribute new ideas, information, good sources of reliable science into the decision-making process. So here we need people. We need people with experience, careful judgment, and cross-sectoral experience. And we also need a responsible private sector or industry that is held accountable for their ecological footprint and consistently strive to improve environmental performance. The second element of, uh, of important in the framework is responsible governments. And these governments need to recognize their fiduciary, responsible to Cana fiduciary responsibility to Canadian citizens, including First Nations, to sustain the essence of public resources for long-term use and employment of the entire populace. And this would involve an open, transparent decision-making process that accurately reflects the values of its citizens. So here we need world-class science that's detailed and current and publicly accessible, and we need innovative financial structures. So as uh, Rob was also talking about, decision making just doesn't involve uh, just government officials. It involves a whole variety of actors that are now making decisions about water management. Um, I wanted to talk about how to move 
uh, how to implement the water ethic that I was talking about. And one fundamental aspect of this involves democratic decision making and ensuring that these decision makers can tap into the expertise that they need to develop feasible and thoughtful policy solutions. So we all have a role in this to play, like I was saying, from bureaucrats who write briefing notes to NGOs who submit critical reports. It's about getting the information to the right ear um, at, in a timely fashion. So there's typically five processes that I wanted to mention that enable decision makers to acquire value and consider expertise that they otherwise wouldn't. Or how, or you know, these processes can also be thought of as how to learn from others. So the first is informing, and this is sort of um, the more, the, the simplest way of informing decision makers. And it might be through, for example, websites or briefing notes. Second, uh, consulting is a little bit more intense, and it's about um, decision makers seeking direct advice from experts on real world policy solutions. So for example, parliamentary committee um, will have hearings and they'll invite experts to come and testify. Third, Sorry, Nancy, can I just interrupt you for a minute? Sure. Um, can you just speak a bit slower? We have some um, um, non-native English speakers on the line. That oh, okay, sure. Yeah, thanks. So third is engagement, and this is the process of asking a group of stakeholders who might not always agree with each other to meet and arrive at a solution that addresses a specific problem. So for example, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Alberta Environment created the, fa the Phase 2 Framework Committee consisting of various stakeholders who were to reach a consensus on a framework that guides the water withdrawals from the Athabasca River by oil sands operators. The fourth uh, way is collaboration. And collaborating would involve all participants, as Rob was explaining, jointly framing an issue and participating in the process. So for example, the Canadian Water Research Resources Association um, initiated a collaborative process for developing a water strategy for Canada. And they're bringing together various stakeholders and beginning to outline a framework. And finally, capacity building can be defined as creating and sustaining the capacity for innovation. And what counts here is that there's the ability to evaluate the actions that have been happening and to make adjustments along the way. So for example, the International Joint Commission uh, demonstrated capacity building in their role implementing the 1972 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So flexibility and adaptability to apply new knowledge was a distinctive feature of the agreement. And prior to the mid-1990s, the IJC involved a large community beyond government that was fostered by the need to review progress toward meeting the requirements of the agreement and modifying the agreement to reflect any sort of new circumstances or new information. So, What's your strategy? As, uh, as Rob mentioned, there's lots of players in water governance and each with their own role. Moving towards sustainable water management will require decision making that's based, that's based on the best available information and creative policy solutions. As such, we all have a role to play in informing this process. So the most appropriate strategy, and I know that Rob's also discussed some of this, the most appropriate strategy for linking knowledge and decision making might differ depending on uh, the policy issue, so its point in evolution um, or, or the decision maker itself. So the one example that I wanted to highlight was uh, a campaign by the Polis Project. They're working to secure appropriate water pricing um, and talking to different municipalities, and they have different strategies for depending on how far along municipalities are. So for instance, um, municipalities that haven't had a lot of time to reflect on this issue, they might send them brochures or fact sheets to start, get them to start thinking about it. For municipalities who are a little bit further along, they might take a more um, consulting or engagement approach and work with them to, to move them further. Um, another important consideration when deciding which strategy to take is the potential for, for change. So when developing a strategy, actors should individually and collectively determine the degree of change that they're seeking. So for instance, are we trying to make routine and incremental changes within the existing system with the goal of making that system work better? Or are you trying to advocate for a new policy domain in which policy issues are defined, solved, and combined differently? So FLOW, for instance, aims to try to do both, 
I think, and for the most part we end up spending our time on the former set of issues, trying to make routine changes. Um, and in the meantime, we spend, we look for opportunities to create more fundamental change. And here, we're keeping our eyes open for policy windows, which bring me to the third point. So policy windows are opportunities uh, caused by crisis or regime changes that might allow for or provide opportunity for change. And I just wanted to list a couple examples of policy windows that I see might uh, be coming down the line. Um, first, interjurisdictional coordination on water. And we've mentioned uh, CCME, who have released a five-point water vision. And the Council of Federation has also released a water charter. Uh, second, there's increased awareness of water issues in the public. And some of this is due to unfortunate circumstances like Walkerton. But I think that there might be an increasing positive message as well through things like World Water Day or um, pers you know, improvement or perceived improvement of the quality of, of lakes and rivers. I think, uh, thirdly, water is, I think, a little bit of a hot topic right now, and it's grabbed the attention of some high-profile stakeholders. So, for example, RBC has their $50 million blue water project. There's the Blue Legacy Project with Alexandre Cousteau, and um, recently Guy Liberté uh, from Cirque du Soleil held a, a webinar with the One Drop Foundation. And um, finally, I think there's lots of provincial work going on, BC's looking at its Water Act right now. The Northwest Territory has just introduced their water strategy. We have Nova Scotia and New Brunswick who've introduced their, or who are working on their water strategies. So I think what's important is to build on this momentum and take advantage of these circumstances to improve strategic and coordination of management, uh, management of water resources that reflects this water ethic that I was talking about and the Canadian values towards water. So what does this mean for you? If you need to take away three important messages, this is what I'd like you to remember. First, we need a well-functioning democracy that involves civic engagement, responsible private sector, active academics, and responsible governments. We need to work together to facilitate cross-sectoral dialogue and interdisciplinary knowledge among ourselves and into the decision-making process. And thirdly, we need to look at policy windows. We need to be flexible and adaptable and respond to these opportunities that arise. So one of the ways that Flow does this is we publish a regular newsletter called the Flow Monitor. And what we try to do is track some government action on in the water policy domain. Um, Flow's other specific goal is to create and take advantage of these emerging opportunities for broader water policy reform and to partner with governments and other organizations uh, that, to make this reform possible. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, for question period, I have a number of uh, Flow members here that would be happy to take your questions. I have Ralph Pentland and Oliver Brandis, as well as Marc Houdin, who uh, can take questions in French if there are any. Nancy, that's great. And I will help facilitate questions for you. We had one um, ab about engaging the public, but I believe, um, just reading through the chat, that he was happy with how you address civic engagement. But maybe can you speak to going beyond? He did have a good point that websites are not enough to engage unless you first educate them. And maybe um, while uh, education in, in schools isn't a full perspective, but maybe you can speak to addressing education of the public. Oh, hello? <laughs> hello?
Just a reminder, today's conference is being recorded. Hello, everyone. Hi, hi. We got cut off. We did. We we all all got cut off. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, now that everyone's now unmuted, please mute your line just so it it helps um the conversation go more smoothly. I hear a lot of people on the line, and if everyone can just go through and mute themselves. And Nancy, are you on the line? Yes. Okay, good. Um, it sounds like we can, it sounds good enough that we will continue with questions until everyone else gets back on. Um... Oh, uh, Carrie just explained there's a thunderstorm in Toronto. Oh. <laughs> Nancy? Yes. Okay. Um, so I can I think I actually can hear the rain. It must must be that good. Why don't we start with Selena's question to for Ralph? If he had a magic wand, this is very good, Selena, could, and could make one change in water governance in Canada, what would it be? Okay, good, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I guess basically it's, it's capacity. Um, if you think back, uh, at the time of the 1987 water policy, we were kind of at a peak in capacity in both uh, our ability to do things and our capacity to do science. Um, then along came uh, globalization and, and the, the competitiveness competitiveness agenda, and we began to uh, hollow out governments, we began to deregulate, we deregulated in a big way. Uh, we did it through sneaky sort of ways, we did it through self-regulation, through uh, voluntary approaches, through uh, changing from the uh, precautionary approach to the uh, to a risk management approach and through smart regulation and so on. So now we're at a point where we have little capacity and little uh, ability to actually enforce anything. So there's very almost no enforcement of environmental law in Canada right now. And it's, it's partly due to uh, a lack of capacity, partly due to uh, a, a preference which came with globalization, I guess. So, but, but I think you have to start and re rebuild. The, the magic wand, I guess, would be to start uh, rebuilding uh, science and policy capacity from the top and, and, and building, continuing to build. We, we made a lot of progress from the bottom up there building capacity at the local and watershed level and, and cross-fertilization at that level. But we need a lot stronger uh, science policy uh, from the top and, and bottom-up decision-making action. Uh, thank you, Ralph. And we seem to have lost our chat box. I'm just going to pull it up. I thought of everything but rainstorms <laughs> <laughs> when planning this. Um, Lots of questions about this connection. I hope everyone's finding their way back. Uh, the number, if you scroll back to the top of the chat box, I do have uh, the 1-800 teleconference number as well as the participant code. Um, I have it highlighted right now. But back to questions. And I hear Oliver's in the room, so he promised me he'd stay away from the technology. That it, yeah, he... He didn't cause the thunderstorm. <laughs> I am influential, but not that way. You're not that influential? Okay, well, we're waiting for people to come back on the line. I do have a question uh, for any FLOW member, but uh, I suspect Ralph or Mark maybe um, en français can speak to this, but we've seen a lot of action by provincial and territorial governments to release water policies, both water conservation policies as well as strategies and across the country, and a lot of um, provinces and territories are under development. Um, their policies are under development, which is very exciting, but um, 
With all the action at that level, how can the Fed play a supportive role to support what is being done um, while providing leadership and also not stepping on toes, which often becomes a political um, mind, mind game? Yeah, the, the jurisdictional question is particularly difficult in Canada. Um, if, if you look at, for example, the uh, um, pollution, toxic pollution load uh, in Canada and the U.S., and you, you do comparisons, you'll see that uh, uh, whether it's per job or per, per dollar of production, uh, our pollution is about 50% higher than the Americans. And the main reason for that is that, uh, that in the Americans, they do have floor standards, and the, pro and the states do, in fact, obey those, follow those floor standards, and, in fact, in some cases, they have higher standards. In Canada, the provinces have sort of uh, adopted their prerogative to set their own standards. In many cases, they're, they're lower than the federal standards. In other cases, the federal standards just don't exist. In, in fact, in most cases, they don't. And uh, like under the Fisheries Act, there's, there's six uh, industrial standards, and they actually only implement two of them, and they don't even implement the two that they say they're implementing. So um, basically, we have a problem at the federal level, we've hollowed out a lot of the science and monitoring. Uh, we, we basically out of the regulation business at the federal level. Uh, the provincial level, there's a lot, of, a lot of regulation goes on, not by regulation and enforcement, but by gentlemen's agreements and backdoor negotiation and so on. So we ended up, we've ended up with a system in Canada where our performance is very, very poor relative to the U.S., and the U.S. is very, very poor relative to the European countries, for example. So we're kind of at the bottom of the pack uh, internationally, and uh, we've got a, a very difficult situation to overcome. Uh, to overcome that would be very difficult in our constitutional setting. And Mark has something to add. What can I say? Yes. Uh, I'll add something in French there. Um Au Québec, les chaînes de compétences sont très importantes, puis c'est certain que nous, euh, en ce qui est trait aux actions que le gouvernement fédéral pourrait prendre, dans les chaînes de compétences comme euh, les voies navigables, les eaux transfrontalières euh, sur les réserves indiennes, il y a amplement d'espace pour lui permettre d'établir des, des nouvelles réglementations, une nouvelle politique qui pourrait s'agencer euh, en même temps que celles que les provinces comme le Québec euh, veulent mettre en place. Puis on est très soucieux de s'assurer qu'on va lui donner l'appui au gouvernement fédéral de faire ses devoirs pour ses champs de compétences, tout en préservant les styles de la province du Québec, par exemple. Want me to repeat in English? <laughs> Liz, what do you think? No, I'm actually thrilled that it's that we have someone to speak French. It's fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Um, and I do actually want to keep going with the questions because we have um, from Jason, in light of the comments, it seems that community monitoring and possibly enforcement enforcement becomes increasingly important. Can you comment? And it's not directed at anyone specifically, so whoever feels that they want to take that. I think that's absolutely true. Uh, if you look at the natural tendencies of governments, the uh, local government does tend to want to enforce because they're close to the people and they want to show that they're protecting the health and safety of their citizens. As you get further up, the further up you go, there's a, the, there's the political will kind of evaporates because the, uh, the, uh, the blame is very focused and the, and the credit is very spread out. And so as the higher up you go, so, so if you can, if the, the lower down you can actually enforce and implement, the better off you are. But you do, you do have to um, do that within the context of top-down policy and science. You have to know what you're doing, and you can do your science most efficiently at, at the higher level. And you do have to have standards that are um, as broad as possible to avoid pollution havens and that sort of thing. One thing I just want to mention is that one of the things that um, um, partly we don't regulate very good because because we don't have the capacity to do it. Another reason, though, is because we think inherently we think that it's bad for our innovation, competitiveness, and, and, and productivity, and all those sorts of things. But there's an awful lot of research out these days that suggests the opposite: that that good, effective regulation is actually good for innovation, and it does can can actually lead to uh, a stronger competitiveness by by countries, by jurisdictions, but even for companies. Um, but you have to use to, to get to that uh, conclusion, you have to use the lag effect. I mean, the, the immediate effect of a regulation is to, 
to cause profits to drop and and and, and some jobs to be lost. But if you if you lag it three or four or five years, you can reach the opposite conclusion that after three or four or five years, good strong strict regulation, the right kind of regulation, can be good even for uh, even for companies. I'm just going to add one thing to the idea of you know community monitoring, community based science. Is that <clears throat> that's a huge untapped asset, but it requires senior government to play its role. So it's, it's it, it can't be a replacement for senior government activity, but as a complement or synergistic with. And that I think again relates to the theme that Ralph is emphasizing that we're missing sort of these key first pieces, these key roles for both province and the federal government, both enforcing a set of basic rules, but also providing that basic background science that then enables this good quality community engagement to really make a difference so the value add becomes very, very high. And there, uh, as a follow-up, Nicole um, had a question about water regulation um, compared to the EU. And since we're on the topic of regulation, maybe we can speak to um, comparing it to the European Union's water regulation? Yeah, well, the, the European Union um, system is, is far superior to anything in North America because they have, they have done it the other way around. I mean, in Canada, what provinces worry about is that the federal government might impose standards on them, and they don't like that as a constitutional matter. But in Europe, it's happened the other way around. You had, you had the countries come together themselves and they created this union, and, and they actually uh, asked the, the government, the government of Europe in Belgium, to enforce, to put in place and enforce standards, very strong standards right across the union. And the other thing that's much stronger in Europe than it is in North America is the, is the transparency. Every, every three years, I think, they're required to report uh, actual effluence and actual drinking water standards and so on, uh, conditions against standards on the uh, European scale. So you can achieve an awful lot through um, simple information. If you, if you put out very good information about who's polluting what, where, who's providing good water and who's not, that, that in itself would do an awful lot of good. But just the, the situation over there is far healthier than it is here simply because they do have enforceable union-wide standards, and they are enforced, and they are done so in a very transparent way. We don't have any of those features here in North America. We have some of them in the U.S. They're better than we are, but ours is, is weaker than the U.S., and both Canada and the U.S. are weaker than Europe. Uh, thank you, Ralph. We have um, two more questions. I'm going to handle Bridget's uh, comments, but maybe um, Jim Duncan had a question. Is it possible that Polaris, and I think he means Polis, Polis Institute, and Polaris is actually a different organization, can help community groups engage in monitoring to network across Canada? And maybe, Oliver, you can speak to that as the project leader of the Polis Project. Well, yeah, obviously that's not entirely our role, but I think it highlights the importance of organizations that can do that well. And I just bring your attention to there's a, a group called the Living Lakes Network that's forming that's trying to do exactly that. So I play a, a very small advisory role there to help engage that. But I do think that there is, and this is part of I think what Rob was talking about in his earlier session, that there are some really new, interesting new actors and players arriving on the landscape. And this is an area where we're seeing, you know, 15 years ago, there was no need, they didn't exist. Well, now we're seeing the need emerging, and now we're seeing the response by civil society. And in many places, it's connected through NGOs, academics, uh, universities. They're recognizing that some of the messages are getting lost before they arrive at government. So they're trying to energize this dialogue by giving some of these organizations exactly what we're talking about, some of the capacity that's missing out there. So I do think it's extremely important, but to answer the question, can I or can Polis, can the Polis project do it? I don't think so. We just don't have the capacity for that, but we definitely work collaboratively, and that's a big change that's happening. Okay, I'm going to have one more question, and then I'm going to um, wrap up. But uh, we have a question. Do you see the drinking water quality management standard as a positive contribution to the development of a water strategy? Uh, I'm going to at least start answering that. 
Um, yes, yeah, drinking water is one of the, and safe drinking water for all Canadians is one of the main uh, priority areas discussed in changing the flow, which is uh, flow's mandate. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is if you wanted to find more information about that, you can refer to the report that Ecojustice and Flow just put out called Seeking Water Justice. And we specifically outline uh, recommendations for the federal government to implement national drinking water regulations uh, to bring up the standard of drinking water for all communities. I might just add that uh, Canada is one of two countries in the world that don't have doesn't have uh, national drinking water standards. The other one is Australia. Uh, Australia is a little different because it's got 2.2 very strong provinces, I guess. But we're, we're, if we set aside Australia, Canada is the only industrialized country in the world without national drinking water standards. All right. Thank you so much. And someone in the, the chat box just said, you know, I joined late. It's interesting. And it's true. We always, I think, the, as the conversation heats up, you, we always have to cut it off. And I will have to cut it off at this point. But thank you so much for everyone who had questions. Um, and please do sign up for the next webinar. Um, because the webinar series is just that, a series, we do try and build on each webinar. Um, and I want to note, someone had asked, well, how are these messages, what are we doing with these messages? And in the next two weeks, we will be putting together a briefing note that will cover the t topics and the challenges and also the opportunities and some of the solutions we talked about today. And we will be targeting those briefing notes at senior level government officials for across the country. So we will be trying to get the conclusions of these webinars out to the broader public and the decision-making um, audience. Again, the webinars have been recorded today and will be posted on www.waterpolicy.ca. And I will send out the briefing notes, I, I'm just looking at the chat box, to all the participants on the line. And again, thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day. And for those in Toronto, uh, get an umbrella. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll speak next call. Bye-bye.